one tractor and, and uh, two horses. And we just got out there in the dirt and we didn't know anything about farming. We didn't know anything about building a town. Very few trades. We was all ex-English majors, uh, college dropouts, uh, high school students, uh, grown up in, in urban and suburbia environments. But we, we were serious about farming and wanting to do this community. And the neighbors saw that we were serious and saw that they didn't have to be afraid of us. And that was, we made friends with a whole bunch of folks who are still our close friends and good neighbors right now. And after we made a number of friends with the neighbors, this piece of land turned up, which was sitting on right down, right around the corner. A fellow that had seen us on TV and felt like he wouldn't mind selling this piece of land to us, sold us this land and we paid $70 an acre for just a real beautiful piece of land, which is way back up here in the woods, down off the end of the, nowhere near any main highways. And uh, just perfectly what we were looking for just turned up after we had made friends with the neighbors and they weren't freaked out about us being here anymore. <laughs> So that's, that's how come we landed here, and that was four years ago. And since then, we bought another, that was 1,000 acres that we bought, and we bought another 750. So we've got 1,750 acres here and about 750 people after four years. And other satellite pieces of land around here that, uh, that we're farming. So that we're all told farming about 800 acres this year including some land down in uh, Homestead, Florida, which is real fertile vegetable land down in the southern tip of Florida. And getting heavy into farming, the farming, Kara's husband, Michael, was the head of our farming crew. He didn't know anything about farming when we got here. He had done a little organic farming out in California, gardening more than farming. And now is the head of our entire farming crew of maybe how many men? How many folks? Maybe 50 folks farming this farm and all these satellite farms in this immediate area plus our homestead land and he's always looking for more land always ready to plant plant some more beans and, and grow some more food and this after four years they've gotten competent enough in farming that the farming operation pays for itself with what they grow and uh, that's really a neat thing because we can live and eat pretty cheaply we can live before this year, it was costing us 40 cents a day to eat per person. And now, with the farming operation paying for for all their operation, that was including what it cost to farm. Now it doesn't cost us anything to farm because the farming operation is paying for that. Uh, could you give me a rundown of what the, the farm operation is like? Uh, say the structure and how, how you do things. The structure? <laughs> loose, <laughs> loose. <laughs> well, you know, it's structured loosely. Like it's like uh, we do. A, we got a whole lot of operations all happening at one time. Like just right now, we got a crew combining wheat. We got it. There's folks out planting soybeans. Just a couple hours later, when it gets warmer, they'll be out uh, um, baling wheat straw off the wheat fields, and uh, um, folks are out cultivating soybeans and uh, folks are on the farm harvesting harvesting green beans tying tomatoes uh, um, hoeing and cultivating different vegetables and uh, and fruit and uh, a great big crews out uh, not a real big crew about eight people <laughs> is out harvesting uh, onions and uh, we're putting them up uh, got about eight acres of onions that we're out harvesting so we got and then we got our shop here and we got a compost crew and uh, uh, we always got a whole bunch of things all happening at once. So what we got is like a, we break it up into smaller crews. We got a crew that, that covers the field crop operation and a crew that covers the uh, the root crops like the sweet potatoes and the potatoes and the onions because they all uh, 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 they grow and we take care of them a lot alike. And then we got a crew that covers the vegetables, a vegetable crew and a fruit crew that covers the, the uh, orchards and berries and uh, grapes mm -hmm. and watermelons. And so like, each crew like takes after each of these crops and there's like a, a straw boss to each crew that, that uh, you know, that's got to watch out and make sure they're all doing okay. And then, uh, 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 and then we got a shop that's a big part of our thing. We got five or six men in the shop. We got about 
14 or 15 trucks and about seven tractors and a combine and uh so the shops like our uh uh you know keep starting to uh put them back out on the road about as fast as they break down uh, when it's all going right mm -hmm. and uh and uh, i watch out after the whole thing and uh uh, uh try to keep the whole thing uh, integrated what are your names? my name's kara i'm mary louise and you're the midwives here two yeah. of them how many midwives are there five all together on the farm right now there's three uh-huh i'm amazed on tour and we have another midwife up in wisconsin on the wisconsin farm her twin sister and the twin sister. Oh, yeah. yeah how many babies have you delivered uh fit about 57. how did you get into midwifing uh, I was drafted. Uh -huh. <laughs> One night I got told to go help at a birthday and went. And what right. about you? How many babies have you? Eighteen I delivered. I got drafted on the caravan because I was I just got to help out because I was one of the only ladies that ever even seen a baby born. I'd only seen one born before. Uh -huh. and we just started out from scratch. So neither of you had had any other kind of training? Mm -hmm. no. no. Well what uh, are some things that you really need to know? To be a midwife, starting in generals, not specifics, uh -huh. right away. Well, I feel like the main thing is that compassion, so you can know what somebody else is feeling and, and guide them through a heavy place, because it is a heavy place. And that's and you know we have really good sound technical knowledge behind all that, but that spiritual place is really the one that gets mm -hmm. our babies out healthy and grooving, mm -hmm. and our mother keeps our mothers grooving. Hmm. It, it's really spiritual midwife for you. Because Stephen and I and Mae, that's what we've really learned how to do it from them. And like all the technical backup, like Carol was saying, really feels good and strong. Like our ambulance and all the equipment we have, and that makes it really solid, but it's the spiritual thing that really does it. Because you know? each birth is really a miracle. We see miracles happen all the time. This is tempeh. This is a, a piece of cooked tempeh. Tempeh is an Indonesian food that's a staple in the diet over there. And it's made by taking soybeans, which have been cooked a really short time, and drained and dehulled and inoculated with a mold. It's a white mold. And overnight, the mold grows and binds the beans into like a solid white cake so that you can slice it and fry it. And this is just steamed in water, but when you fry it, it, it looks, it's really golden brown, and it looks like fried fish or fried chicken and it's it's delicious it tastes it tastes somewhat like that too a spore like differs from a seed in that a spore doesn't have any nutrients in it that will make it germinate by itself you just have to put it in the right conditions and then it'll grow it only a spore only contains like the genetic information so it you know unless it's exposed to moisture so that another mold could get in or something it, it'll stay it's pretty stable it'll it'll stay for a couple months at least well any vegetarian diet lacks b12 any any true vegetarian diet like b12 is found only in animal products such as milk cheese or eggs or meat or uh, it's also found in seaweeds that's about the only exception in the vegetable kingdom is that b12 is found in in most seaweeds but if you're if you're going to be a vegetarian you should really get get a b12 supplement or get it in nutritional yeast that's been fortified with vitamin b12 because it, it will store in your body for a period of time, but you know you you can store it for quite a while. But you know when you run out, it's you know it's serious. It's it's a thing that everybody should have in their diet. How do you decide what you grow? And where? Well, it's our fifth season. We've gone through lots of changes about that, and uh, uh, at the end, that you know, like sometime as we come up to this beginning of this winter, we'll decide what we want to do next year. We're growing 800 acres this spring. And in the south, you get to grow, uh, you get to double crop, you get to plant a crop in the fall that'll grow through the winter and you harvest in the spring of, of uh, small grains of wheat and oats and rye and barley on, you know, as much land as you want to. So we so by this fall, we'll really try to have it up to a thousand acres and about half of that will be in grain and the other half will be in the cover crop. And we we just figure it out according to like, uh, uh, we've been learning over the years how much we eat, you know, like we'll grow so many acres of tomatoes and it, 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 you know, it'll seem like we want some more. So we'll grow so much more intensive, 
in terms of what we want to eat, and then we grow to sell too because we sell enough. We want to feed the farm and sell enough uh, of everything we grow to pay for the expense of our operation, including like expanding it. And then uh, 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 over and above that, we want to get big enough so we got extra stuff that we can be giving away. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, the, the farthest out thing we've been realizing about this whole trip is that how much we're capable of doing and like every year it just blows our mind like we realize how much we can expand until we're just right at the place now where where you know we we just you know it just blows our mind all the time on how big of an operation we can be getting to have a partnership of 50 or 100 people that that would, could all be farming together like uh you know there's nobody else anywhere that i know about that has like that kind of a a thing where the, where there's like that heavy of a partnership that everybody has that much commitment. This is a a school, a spiritual school, and Stephen is a spiritual teacher. So that everybody who comes here wants to study with him and makes an agreement with him to do that when they come to the gate. So if somebody comes to the gate thinking perhaps they want to live here and uh, come in, sign on at the gate. The gate's a big part of our action. We get a lot of visitors. Maybe we had close to 15,000 visitors last year. We're going to have more than that this year. So some folks come to visit and have a look. Some folks come thinking they want to live here. Some folks come to look and then decide they'd like to live here. Some folks see the book, see Stephen on tour, whatever the reason, come through here. We, say, we invite them to come in and live with us in our visitors' quarters or live with our families here on the farm for a little while work with us, eat with us, just live with us for a couple of days and have a get a better look at it. And uh, so they can better make up their minds. If somebody is really serious and really wants to do this thing, uh, we can take them on as a soaker, what we call a soaker. And you come in and you're visiting for a while, then you can soak for a while and just live with us and do it day by day. Soak it up. And... Uh, just living with the people and then Stephen has meetings on occasion soakers meetings at the gate where all his folks have a chance to talk to him and he can go around and have a little peyote meeting without without peyote but just talk to the folks and find out what they're doing why they want to live here what's going on and folks make an agreement with him so that everybody living here has made an agreement with Stephen at one time and uh, so if you're gonna if you make that agreement with him you sign on, including signing a vow of poverty, which is where we share everything and hold everything in common, including you know, all of your your uh, bank account and car. That kind of thing is into the pot. You throw that into the pot. So it's a serious agreement and important that folks that, that decide are really serious and really know that that's what they want to do, which is why we have this soaking period in which they can go through and decide. Then uh, we have a have a lady who's just in charge of housing. She knows what all the housing situations are. And we have straw bosses of various gigs, like the farming crew has a straw boss in charge of the farming crew, and then different departments of the farming crew, like the vegetables and the fruit fruit and uh, field crops are all departments, and they're, they have straw bosses for those departments. And all this structure has just kind of grown up organically where folks have just taken on responsibility and then they're doing it and then that's their job. And it's nothing that we planned from in front, it's just something that grew up. That's a good basis, uh, like the organization, everybody always wants to know about how the farm is organized, how the decisions get made. And there's no set way, but it just seems to grow up. It's, it's, sometimes it seems like a perfect democracy because everybody has a chance to get his idea to bring his idea manifest but it's up to the agreement with the folks is how much agreement you can get with the farm to do what you want to do and there's a, there's a lot of agreement to do to raise our food and uh, so the farming crew is a big part of our operation there's a lot of agreement to get our vehicle keep our vehicles going and, and to have a good medical staff and all that kind of thing just grows organically in a community and but basically, it's a spiritual agreement based on spiritual principles and ideas that we had agreed on before we came here. So everything that we do is in harmony with those principles, and we're not going to do anything outside of those principles. 
So that so that keeps a certain flavor here of love and trust and compassion, which is the main thing that's happening here is, is between the folks. But there's certain things that we need to do, like raise our food. So these things have grown up. And if you come to the farm, if you have a trade, you might want to go and, and pursue that trade. You might not have a trade. You might just want to try things out. And there's a chance for you to try different parts of the operation and see how you like it. Switch around a little bit. Flop around. Maybe some folks do something for a couple of years and then move on to another crew and do something else for a couple of years. And you get a chance to try your hand at all kinds of things that you looked at all your life but never had a chance to do. And it's like Karen was saying before, it's like anything you ever dreamed of doing, you get a chance to try out.